Hi, welcome back. I did not plan to write about Tesla for a while, given that I have two long posts that I put on the stock just in the last month. But about two days ago, Elon Musk sent out a tweet, and it's perhaps the most extraordinary missive that I've seen from a CEO. In the tweet he said, I'm considering taking Tesla private at $420 per share, funding secure. Extraordinary, right? Because you're in a tweet, He's suggesting that he plans to take the company private, a public to private transaction, one of the largest transactions if it happens, almost $70 billion in market cap, and that he already has the funding secured to make this happen. Of course, in the two days since, we've had lots of questions come up. The first is, did he really mean it? Or was it just a tweet he sent off on the spur of the moment? Why would Tesla go pri private? Is there a payoff for, to it going pri private? And if it decides to go private and it makes sense, where would the funding come from to get the deal done? Those are the questions I'd like to address in this post. So let's start by looking at the trade-off between being a private business and a public company. And let's first look at it from the perspective of the business. There are differences between being a private and a public company, and here are the differences. The first, if you think it in terms of access to capital, it is far easier for a public company to access capital, especially in large amounts, than a private business. It is true that things have eased up for private businesses, that you have more sources of capital, that you can be a big private company like Uber and continue to stay private, but it still remains true that it's easier to access large amounts of capital as a public company than a private company. Second, in terms of information disclosure, it is true public companies are saddled with far more mandated disclosure requirements, some reflecting the fact that there have been scandals related to public companies in the past, but there are more mandated disclosure requirements. It's not that private businesses don't have to disclose information, but generally the mandated requirements tend to be far smaller in private businesses and they come from investors asking for information. The third comes from control and governance. Public companies are governed by corporate governance rules that apply across companies. Doesn't mean that governance is strong, but you have to follow the rules. Private companies, it's more laissez-faire. It's not that governance is weaker in private companies. In fact, often it's stronger, but it's negotiated between the investor and the company. Put differently, if I'm an equity investor and you come to me as a private business, I negotiate how much control, how much say I have in the company. I might demand that a couple of the directors be appointed for me. So to the extent that I can negotiate stronger terms, governance might actually be stronger in private businesses, but in public companies, there are far more hoops to jump through because of the legal requirements. Fourth, in terms of monitoring, in private businesses, there's a heck of a lot of monitoring, but it's from the investors in the company asking questions. And to the extent that they don't ask questions, there might be no monitoring. In public companies, the monitoring, again, is part of the game. You have analysts, both buy side and sell side, who are trained to ask you questions. It's an entire game that's built around these, these disclosures. The, the questions are often around earnings reports, and we've seen what companies have to do to keep analysts happy. So the monitoring, again, is external in public companies. It tends to be more internal in private companies. And finally, in terms of pricing, private businesses get priced, but only when new capital is raised. And if no new capital is being raised, you can go through extended periods where nobody's repricing the company. It doesn't mean the value isn't changing, but nobody's repricing it. With public companies, you get continuous repricing by a market with all its faults and, and pluses and minuses, you get market pricing. So public versus private, you have a trade-off. Public companies have more access to capital, but in return, they have to accept more mandated disclosure requirements, more rules that are set by outsiders in corporate governance, more monitoring by outsiders, especially analysts, and finally, a pricing that is continuous and in some cases, not that good for the company involved. Let's look at the invest from an investor perspective, the difference in investing in a private business as opposed to public company. The biggest difference is liquidity. When you invest in a public company, you get more liquidity, not perfect liquidity because you still have less liquid stocks versus more liquid stocks, but you can sell your stake or buy a stake in a company at a much lower cost. In a private business, though things are improving again, there tends to be less liquidity. It's much more difficult to get into a company and get out of a company. The second is in terms of the structure of your equity investment itself. In a private business, you get far more flexibility in how you design your equity investment. If you look at how venture capitalist agreements are made with companies, you will often notice they're very investment specific. Each venture capitalist can put in protections that he or she feels 
he needs to keep investing in the company. Protections against future capital raises, against future dilution, future pricing drops. It's much more difficult to tailor your investment if you're a public company. So the design flexibility is less with public companies, more with private businesses, but the liquidity is far greater with public companies than with private businesses. The disclosure requirements as we saw earlier, it's not that one is more or less, but the disclosure requirements of public companies tend to be mandated. So if you're an investor who isn't pushing for the information, it's going to come to you anyway. But if you're a private business and you're an investor in a private business, if you don't push for the information, it doesn't have to be disclosed to you. So the degree of disclosure again varies across investors. And finally, in terms of control and governance, public companies, you have more externally imposed rules on corporate governance with private business, it's negotiated with the investors. Now, what does this all mean? If you're an investor in a private business and you don't have the power to negotiate better disclosure and better control, you're left you know, unprotected. That is why the SEC or whatever the regulatory agency is in the market that you operate in, tends not to allow private companies to have thousands of small investors because those small investors get the worst of all worlds. They get the lack of liquidity that they get with a private investment and because they cannot ask for information and they don't have any power to change the company, they get none of the information and none of the governance. So in a sense, there's nothing wrong with a private investment if you can negotiate from a position of strength and most venture capitalists do, but it might be a position of weakness if you're a smaller investor. Now let's look at that trade-off to decide what kinds of companies would be good can candidates for going from public to private. We can see what kinds of companies go from private to public. They tend to be young growth companies that need a lot of capital, are willing to accept the trade-off, but when would that process be reversed? In general, the three things I would look for in a public company will make it a good candidate or a potential candidate for a public to private transaction. The first is it no longer needs capital to keep going. Why? Because it's an aging company, its best days are behind it. And because it doesn't have any growth and it's throwing off enough cash flows from existing investments, it might not need the capital. So it doesn't need that benefit it gets from public markets. The second is the market is pricing it, but the company believes it's price strong. Price strong in what sense? It, the, mar the company believes the market is underpricing the company, given its, given its assets, given its cash flow potential. So the market is underpricing the company. So, the, so you don't need capital, the market is underpricing you. And third, you feel as a company there are actions you need to take that are in your best long-term interest, but you're afraid that if you take them, the market will turn on you. Why? Because the market might be focused on metrics like earnings per share or expected growth rate, that if you take the actions you need to take could be hurt by those actions and the market will punish you. So if you're a company that does not lead large amounts of capital, is underpriced and is, 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 has to take actions that might be looked upon badly by the market, well, you're a pretty good candidate for public to private. So what kinds of companies traditionally are good candidates for public to private? They tend to be aging companies because they don't need capital anymore, they're aging. They're trading at much lower price earnings ratios or EV to EBITDA multiples than other companies in their peer group, making them underpriced. And third, there are things a company needs to do to fix itself, often to slim down or become a smaller company that might not sit well with public market investors. Now with that, with that setup, let's ask is Tesla a good candidate? Well, it looks as far from a good candidate as you can get. First, it is a growing company that needs immense amounts of capital to deliver on its potential. Now, you might be more optimistic than I am about Tesla's future, but no matter how optimistic you are, there is no way you can tell me that Tesla can keep going without accessing capital for the next decade. If markets are punishing Tesla, they they're punishing them in a very strange way, giving Tesla a much higher market capitalization than companies like Ford and GM that are much larger, more profitable companies. So if Tesla is being punished by markets, most companies would love to be punished the way Tesla is. And finally, it is true that Tesla went through a drama with its 5,000 car target. And there are some in the company who might say, well, given that our production targets have to keep going up, do we need to go through that dra drama? But think about it. Much of the drama around the 5,000 cars a week that, that Tesla went through was self-imposed, was created by the company, from the number, the 5,000, to what Elon Musk did around the target. You could argue that the drama here actually worked in Tesla's best interest, because by focusing attention on a short-term, pretty meaningless goal, 5,000 cars by itself a week doesn't mean much, 
Tesla was able to draw attention away from bigger problems that the company has. So Tesla doesn't seem to me a good candidate for a buyout. Now let's move to the next phase. Let's assume that whatever, for whatever reason you believe that Tesla is a good candidate, think about how you'd fund this buyout if you decide to do it. If you think about going public to private, you have a funding issue, and here's why. As a public company, you have public debt and public equity. If you become a private company, that public debt has to become private debt and the public equity has to become private equity. If you can convince those com those banks and bondholders who, who have lent you money as a public company to become your lenders as a private company, your problem for debt becomes a, a relatively simple one. But public equity to private equity is tougher because what you have to do is come up with private equity investors who can buy out the public equity. Now, those private equity investors can be companies like KKR or Blackstone. They can be wealthy individuals. They can be managers of the company if they're wealthy enough to do it. But essentially, you can have to replace public to, with private equity. Now, let's think about the classic buyout. The classic buyout, of course, is of an aging company that has significant cash flows and underpriced. In a classic buyout, you do tend to see public debt replaced with private debt in much larger quantities. That's why it's called a leverage buyout. The reason being, if you're underpriced and you have good cash flows and earnings, you should be able to carry a lot more debt. So the people doing the buyout are able to borrow more. So they replace public debt with private debt. And often the private debt is much larger than the public debt. The private debt holders are not being stupid. They negotiate in covenants and protections for themselves. The public equity to private equity, the private equity is provided by a player like KKR or Blackstone that wants to make money off the deal and is supplemented by managers. You've got to bring the managers into the game because you want to make their interests aligned, because you want to make sure this deal goes through. And the end game in a classic buyout is not to keep the company private forever, but to fix whatever problems you need to fix and then take it back public at a much higher price, in which case equity investors make a disproportionately large amount of money. Why disproportionately large? Because such a small slice of the company came from equity. That's a classic buyout. Could you pull this off with Tesla? Well, remember, Tesla is a money losing company with negative cash flows. It can't borrow any more money. In fact, I have a serious question about the $11 billion that Tesla already has. Tesla cannot borrow more money. So the question is, how does it fund this buyout? Well, Elon Musk suggested one solution that if it can work through is actually painless. He suggested that existing shareholders in Tesla could become shareholders in this private company. So basically, if you're a Tesla shareholder, you would replace your public company shares with private shares. And he gave an, he, and to give Musk credit, he said, well, if you don't want to do that, I'll buy your shares back at $420 per share. Let's assume that every single shareholder in Tesla takes Tes uh, Musk up on his offer and becomes a private company shareholder. Here's what you will have. Your $72 billion in public equity will become $72 billion in private equity. The existing bondholders, if you can convince them to stay on as debt holders, will become debt holders in a private company. If Tesla can pull this off, it is a painless solution. The only problem is twofold. The first is probably not legal, and here's why. If every Tesla shareholder, the public company, becomes a shareholder of the private company, Tesla will have more than 2,000 shareholders. You're saying, so what? The SEC does not allow a private company to have more than 2,000 private shareholders. So that's going to be a problem. Let's assume that Tesla is able to thread the needle and is able to devise some way of getting around this. And Tesla has been able to do that on a number of other fronts. The second problem is, if you're a Tesla shareholder, even if you are a loyal shareholder, here's the question I would have for you. Would you be willing to own shares in a private Tesla where you've lost liquidity and you could have got $420 in cash in your hand? My guess is a lot of shareholders, if they are given that option, will cash out at $420 per share. So this solution, even though it looks so painless and looks great, is not going to work. So what's the other solution? Perhaps, perhaps, Tesla can find a big partner, a big investor who will fill in the gap. Well, there was some excitement about the Saudi Sovereign Fund investing $2 billion in Tesla, but the Saudi Sovereign Fund cannot invest the 55 to $60 billion that Tesla will need to make this buyout happen. It doesn't have enough capital to invest that much in one company. So my guess is no investment fund is going to be able to invest that because you have to spread your bets. What about a big private equity player? The biggest private equity players might be able to pull it off. 
But the ones like KKR and Blackstone, this is not their game. They don't want to invest in a young growth company and hope that growth covers future cash flows. In fact, the only player that I can think who's big enough and who might play this game is SoftBank for three reasons. One is it has the size to be able to access capital to be able to do this. Second, it plays this game. It invests in young growth companies. It's used to cash burn. And third, the company does have a history with Tesla. There were rumors last year that Tesla and SoftBank were talking about doing a deal. The rumors went nowhere because of control issues. That might be the stumbling block here. Masayoshi's son, son, who heads SoftBank, is a bit of a control freak and is a bit of an eccentric. Does that strike you as um, something you've heard about another company CEO? Well, those are words you can use to describe Elon Musk. I cannot imagine Elon Musk and Mr. Sun coexisting in the same company. It'd be a lot of fun. I would pay money to watch those two tango in a company. I don't see, though, how they can share control in Tesla. So what does this all mean? Well, it goes back to that question of funding secured, which is what Elon Musk said in his first week. If the statement is true, I would love to see who he secured the funding from. If he got it from a bank, this must be an insane, an inept bank to be willing to lend that much money to a company that is a money losing company that will not deliver. Okay? If the statement is false, we will be seeing lawyers debating the meaning of the word secured and funding for the rest of eternity. So here's what I have as a potential explanation. What of Occam's Razor? Basically, it says sometimes the simplest explanation is the one that is be the best one. It is entirely possible that we've been over ex explaining what Musk tried to do two days ago. Maybe Musk did not intend to do a deal. Maybe Musk does not have secured funding. So he's saying, why would he do this? Well, I think it goes back to Musk's the, 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 the war that has been fought out between Elon Musk and the short sellers in Tesla. Now, let's face it, every public company is short sellers. But the relationship between Elon Musk and the short sellers in Tesla is particularly poisonous. Musk is obsessed with the short sellers. In fact, think of how many tweets you've heard from Musk you've seen from Musk about the short sellers and how he's going to bring them down. Rightly or wrongly, he believes the short sellers are out to get him and bring the company down. Okay. On the other side, the short sellers seem to hate Musk. In fact, when I posted about Tesla a few weeks ago and I found Tesla to be overvalued, I expected most of the backlash to come from Tesla optimists, Tesla bulls, arguing that I was being over-pessimistic. I actually got backlash from Tesla short sellers saying I was being too optimistic, even though my value was less than half of the price. In fact, I think I have a sneaking suspicion that many Tesla short sellers, for them, victory will not just be making money on the short sale. It's seeing Tesla go out of business. Elon must go bankrupt. Investing is tough enough to begin with. If you make it personal, it gets doubly difficult to do. And both sides in this Tesla short selling game have made it personal. And I hope, I hope and pray this is not true, but it is, it is possible that, that, that this entire episode can be traced back to Elon Musk trying to get back at short sellers. That two days ago he woke up with something, you know, bothering him about the short sellers and he decided to put it into play by sending this tweet out. I, the, three, the reason I say I hope and pray from Tesla's perspective this is not true is if this is the reason Elon Musk has just handed the short sellers that he so hates the weapon they need to bring him down. So we'll find out what, what, what the truth is in the next few weeks because this is now in the legal arena and it's going to play out. But uh, if, if, we're, if we are getting our entertainment from reality shows today, well, this has become the biggest reality show in business. And I, you know, I enjoy watching it, but um, it's, uh, it, it is going to continue. And I, uh, and I hope you will be there on this journey as we talk about Tesla in the future. Thank you very much for letting me share.